So I wanted to do a little bit of commentary to talk about how I execute line work from uh, for an illustration from kind of beginning to end of the process, uh, share a little insight, share a little bit of technique, and explain uh, a little bit more in depth than what I've seen online myself about how to really approach lining. Because lining is a very distinct part of style and execution, and it's really one of my favorite things in digital art. From a starting standpoint, I have this pre-prepared sketch. This took, I think, a couple of hours. It has a fair amount of detail. And I think because of that, it'll be a really good example for talking about how exactly to line an illustration like this, especially a portrait, uh, and how to approach kind of doing something in this style and this type of content as well. This sketch was done with a pressure opacity brush and I did it in color because I like to use color as a distinct foundation to work on top of with line work. It offers a good amount of contrast when I'm in the process of lining and it's also a little bit more easy on the eyes and it offers a little bit of variation and fun to sketching at the same time. It feels a little bit more natural, feels a little bit warmer. All of the brushes that I use from sketching to erasing to lining are pretty much all default round brushes that you can find in any version of Photoshop. Uh, the only one that is using any type of specific settings is going to be my sketch brush, which is just one that has the opacity turned down a little bit as well as the opacity pressure function. I like using default brushes because I love being able to sit down at any workstation and immediately be able to draw anything at a moment's notice. Using default Photoshop brushes is really, at least for my style, all I absolutely need. The only different brush that I will be using is for the background lining, which I will get into uh, when we do the lining for the background. Um, we're going to start off with the character and then we're going to do the background afterwards. One thing that I always do my due diligence with before lining is I always separate my layers. I always keep things like the background separated, the hair separated, keep any VFX work that's going to be treated differently on its own lining layer separated. Um, and also sometimes I keep objects separated as well so that I can manipulate them to be more or less opacitized so I can see more aspects of the piece distinctly. I also put these into a consolidated folder and then bring down the folder's opacity so that I can work off of that. I always keep my opacity very low uh, because what I want to see first and foremost is the line that I'm working on. Your opacity should always be low when you're lining because you need to see how your clean line is going to be developing over the course of the lining process and any edits or any discrepancies that you might need to change as you're lining. Another thing I want to talk about is the use of stabilization for many drawing programs. Uh, Photoshop does offer the ability to use brush stabilization. I personally do not like using brush stabilization. And if you are trying to build a lining skill on a technical level, I would not recommend using brush stabilization at all. The only time that I do use any amount of brush stabilization is either if I am severely rusty or if I am working off of something that is like an iPad, uh, Photoshop on the iPad does have brush stabilization and it's important to use brush stabilization for a product like that because the screen type is much different. Um, I am working personally off of a Wacom Cintiq and the screen is matte and has a more paper-like natural feel to it. When you're working off of a slick screen, I can completely understand using stabilization. Um, but regardless of screen type, I really don't think that stabilization offers too much to artists who are starting out. I think that it more or less is used as a crutch. And I think that there is something really important to create distinction towards when we talk about lines that are the most ideal from a stylistic and also from an artistry perspective. Uh, we want our lines to have life to them. We don't want them to just come off as uh, something that we could create an illustrator, um, something perfect. Lines need to be natural. They need to be flowing. They create a different level of energy towards your piece. And sometimes that means that they're not perfect at the end of the day. And stabilization offers the ability to create beautifully perfect lines, but sometimes that's not always what we need to have. Um, at the same time, what we need to be doing constantly is 
perfecting and building a level of muscle memory and skill and stabilization kind of takes a little bit of that out of the lining process and it's not really going to benefit your hand skill as much as you might think that it will. If you really want to get into lining artwork and creating really beautiful illustrations, you have to practice that skill first and foremost. No amount of a drawing program is really going to produce for you the best work possible. That can only come from your own craftsmanship and your own skill. And that starts with developing it from the beginning rather than leaning on a program's ability to help you. But with all of that in consideration, let's get started. Whenever I start lining, I always start with the eyes. I don't really know why. I think it's because it's the most expressive aspect of the character. And I think because of that, it might be a good jumping off point to really get started. So I'm gonna come in here with a really thin brush. And usually what I like to do is work pretty thin and then build up my lines as I go in distinctive areas. And I'm gonna carve my way along the shape of her eyeliner, keeping my strokes relatively thin. Afterwards, I'm going to fill in that space to make it appear as if this is a much thicker stroke. So moving on to her lower lashes. I wanted to keep these relatively translucent looking um, because I wanted to focus on that line kind of aspect and also use it as a bit of variety and a stylistic choice towards her character design as well. Finding opportunities where you can really show off your lining ability from a design standpoint really makes your line work distinctive and becomes a greater component of your piece as well. So another thing I'm doing with my lines is I'm also tapering with my eraser and I'm also zooming in and out to get a bigger view, a more distant view of how this line work is coming to shape. And the reason why I'm doing that is so that I can visually identify what areas need to be held back in terms of detail and what areas might need a little bit more line, a little bit more detail so that they feel less empty. I'm also zooming out to make sure that my lines are consistent to see if there are any additional strokes that I need to erase or any smoothing that I need to do to the edge of the line to get it to be crisper or to get it to be the shape that I really want it to be. So I think another important thing to discern about the lining stage is that it comes directly after the sketch stage. So if there's any discrepancies that you can really see that were a part of your sketch, this is the best time to be able to fix those, especially going into color afterwards. Uh, you can see here these eyelashes from the sketch to the line that I'm doing right now are a little inconsistent. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix that in this lining phase. And I can recognize that mistake because I'm seeing the sketch with fresh eyes. And that's really something to keep in mind when you're lining as well is, is fixing those discrepancies as you identify them. And I think that's a really important point to expand off of, not just from a lighting perspective, but from an art making perspective in general. Any type of craftsmanship is really going to be a level of uh, process. You're going to make mistakes along the way. And the way that we can recognize those mistakes, understand how to troubleshoot them and even fix them in the moment is just going to make sure that our art is of a higher quality and that it's going to be even more successful as a result. Another thing to recognize about lining is you're not always just drawing a line. Sometimes what you're really doing is creating just a very thin shape. And what that really means is that you're kind of carving in this edge to the piece. Lines are basically supposed to denote on an illustration the edge of a shape. And the way that you're kind of manipulating that edge to serve various purposes for creating something that's soft or creating something that's hard or creating something that's sharp is really going to go into how you're carving out that line and also how you're implementing that line. Are you doing that with tapers? Are you doing that by making a line really thin? Are you doing it by making a line really thicker? How are you creating areas that are more or less bold to really show these edges and these shapes that you're trying to depict in this work? So for her nose here, I'm actually going to come in for this nostril and really darken that corner of it. And what I'm what that's going to do is create a little bit of shadow because the line work is always going to be and skew more dark in a lot of my pieces compared to the fill color. And that's going to create a little bit more depth for that nostril. And it's going to feel as if it goes inward a little bit more. And I also do that for a couple of overlapping areas when it comes towards line work, because it just makes them a little bit more distinct and it makes them transition into one another better. 
And that idea of tapering and transitioning, I think, really comes across in an example like her lips. Lips are kind of a complex shape because there are so many folds and creases that go into their structure. And the way that we can visually discern those folds and creases is through this usage of tapers. What is going to be brought forward and what is going to be sent back in terms of this space. For this section, another thing that I'm really doing is blocking down a thin stroke and then adding in those tapers later. I tend to do this a lot through my lining process, mostly because tapering as you go usually takes a little bit more time. And I like to do all of the tapers together when I can see the entire line work zoomed out and see if I need to really bolden up any areas, really make areas feel more distinct or grounded, or add in more detail or lessen some areas because they are too bold and I need them to fall farther into the background. These scratches are another good example of transitioning the line from a more structured element like her chin and jawline into a more detailed element like her scratches. And these tapers can also help create a little bit more depth. Uh, you can see it kind of on the tips of their shapes. And what this kind of creates is the illusion that these scratches are really sinking into her skin as well. They feel like they have an edge to them, like they are cutting in. And understanding how these things really work in real life, like how scratches sink in or how or like how something like wool is going to be bumpier and softer and recognizing how those things take shape in the real world is what's going to allow you to bring them into the 2D plane and have them retain their level of realism. So sometimes when I'm working on a character piece, there's going to be elements that are going to overlap with other aspects of the line work and other aspects of the body. And this is really one of those case examples of her ear cuff. And what I did to start off with is I kind of shaped out the way that her ear was going to look. And then I added in a new layer that I'm going to start drawing this ear cuff shape over top of this edge. And what this is going to allow me to do is create that new shape without interrupting any of the line work underneath it. This is going to keep the lines way more consistent. And what I'm going to do after I finish shaping out this section is I'm just going to reveal both layers, erase where necessary, and just merge them together so that they're one layer. Another really great tool that Photoshop has built into it is symmetry tools. And I think that this is one of the more powerful aspects of the program. I love using the symmetry tools for lining because you still retain that level of quality and you're also able to be way more precise and way more specific with your lines than if you tried to do any of this stuff yourself. And I always love opportunities of being able to save time when I'm drawing, especially since these pieces can take up to six hours of production time to get finished. So learning tricks like this that aren't going to reduce the quality of your work are really lifesavers. So I kind of wanted to also touch on a misconception that I think a lot of people have about lining. Usually when people can't get a line right and they're doing it over and over and over again, what they think is, oh, instead of having to redraw it a million times, why don't I just use warp functions or liquify functions in my drawing program to manipulate the line into the right place? And what they usually don't realize is that from a graphical standpoint, this is really bad because when you use warp functions and when you use liquify, what that's basically doing is stretching the pixels and it's also reducing the resolution of the line as part of your canvas and leaves a blurry edge to your line. And sometimes, yeah, I understand art can be subjective and, you know, some people might want to desire that effect and some people might have that as a stylistic purpose in their artwork. But as far as I'm concerned and as far as this video is concerned, what I'm going to advise is people to get the best and most crisp lines going forward. And these functions really work against that notion as well as the fact that when people do use this type of method, they don't end up cleaning those raw edges and those blurred edges afterwards, and it just ends up looking so bad. So I would highly advise that you just really practice your muscle memory, really practice your skill, and try and get those ideal lines without having to try and push and pull the pixels. On top of that, there's absolutely nothing stopping you from buffing out a line with your eraser or trying to cut and rotate and fix it like that without using a technique that's going to lower the resolution of your image. 
using a manipulative function like distort or skew or perspective in Photoshop will allow you to get a broader sense of adjusting your line work without having to do something that is so severe. And if you are really hellbent on using liquify or even warp to change your line work, I would advise just going in and buffing out those really blurred edges to make your line work sharper. So as I'm doing the sleeve right here, one thing that I want to kind of shed a little light on is talking about parallel lines when they come towards a lining perspective for character work. Uh, what I like to use is a lot of rings, a lot of parallel lines to denote edges and shapes of borders and stuff like that. And what I usually do is drop down a starting stroke like this, and then I'll add in one right next to it so that I can understand the distance between them. And then sometimes I'll break up the strokes for the rest of the shape and finish it off so that it continues to look consistent. So now it's time to work on her arm and these bracelets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the opacity of my large line work layer and then add a new layer over top of it. And then I'm going to lock the previous layer because I don't want to accidentally merge it with any of the new artwork that I'm doing because that will mean that the opacity in its current state will get solidified. And I really want to make sure that by the end, everything's at 100% opacity. And then I'm going to bring back my symmetry tool and then on this new layer establish these shapes for the bracelets over top of the line work that I was originally working on. What this is going to do is just make sure that the line work of her arm is consistent while I'm adding these bracelet details over top of it. This will also allow me to isolate the bracelet designs and just focus on them. And then what I'll do later is use the symmetry tool to add in some finer details that are a little bit repetitive and that I don't really need to line individually. Also, don't be shy when it comes to copying and pasting, like I'm doing with this bracelet here. Some elements can definitely get repetitive when it comes to lining, and copying and pasting them over, as long as you're not going to see a drop in quality, is definitely going to save you a lot of time in this process. So on top of the sweeping fire of her hair, and the jewels, and the details, and the horns, and everything like that, another reason why I chose this piece to show an example of line work is, of course, her tail which is one of the most complex things that you can really see in the process of line work. These really big, swooping, curving strokes are really going to be the bane of anybody's existence when it comes to lining. And the reason why is because you have to do these really big arc motions with your elbow and with your wrist to get these strokes to look clean and consistent. And sometimes it will take so many tries to even just get the first stroke down. The way that I combat this personally is I break up that starting line into very manageable sections and then I'll go back and connect those lines together. And sometimes when I'm really not feeling drawing that other really long stroke, I will copy over my previous stroke and I will try and manipulate it with certain functions and edit it and touch up some of the angles so that I can build this shape. And now since the body is finished, we are on to her hair. And I'm doing her hair in a highly saturated red color just so that it contrasts from the black line work when I look at all of my line work layers together. I wouldn't say that this picture is the best example of how to line hair considering that it is fire for this piece, but there's a lot of sweeping motions that still go into building up her hair and still a lot of pretty good takeaways when it comes to tapering out those shapes and making them feel really structured and still have a good amount of balance and movement to the piece. Next we have the smoke, which I'm doing in this really nice electric blue or cyan color. And what I'm trying to do here is really push these organic shapes that go into this smoke design. Uh, I also want to keep to these hard edges though, because I want to retain that stylistic quality that the piece is trying to achieve. And I think that this is a good jumping off point to talk about rhythm and talking about pace when it comes to line work. What I'm trying to do here is to keep a consistent rhythm and pace to make sure that these curves are all very consistent with one another. And sometimes changing the speed of your stroke is going to have completely different effects from one instance to the next. So if you feel like your line is a little too shaky, try speeding up your stroke. If you feel like your line is getting a little too straight, maybe try curving things around on a slower motion or speeding up at the start and slowing down at the end. 
changing up that speed and that pacing of your line is going to have completely different effects from one moment to the next and from stroke to stroke. And again, because I'm working with such complex curves for this section of the piece, I'm really more looking to get those large sweeps and then trying to connect those pieces together. Another thing I'm also making sure of for a section like this is that my canvas is angled and rotated to a comfortable position for my hand. Curves like this can really do a number on your wrist if you're not in a comfortable position. And usually how I rotate my canvas in Photoshop is I rotate it with the R tool and then I come right back over when I want to swap it and use escape to snap it right back to its previous position. Knowing the proper keybinds for your drawing program is really going to make the process of lining so much more efficient. I am constantly swapping between my brush tool to add in more thickness to lines or my eraser to take it away or my control Z to undo things altogether. Using other tools like the hand tool to move my canvas around or rotate or escape to swap between different angles is also just going to make sure that I'm getting the best line possible, that I'm not hurting my wrist, and that I'm working efficiently as well. This technique that I'm using right here is kind of my secret to success when it comes to chains. What I end up doing is creating the shape of the chain links with a large thick brush and then I just go over it with my eraser to kind of create slits in that stroke to make it appear as if the larger strokes are actually outlines instead of just large strokes themselves. And then I just go in and touch up certain aspects of it so that the chain links feel like they're connected and it just makes the process so much easier. And then I'll also just go back over those really thin lines with a much thicker brush. And now I'm doing the smoking box or kind of smoking implement that she's really using at the forefront of the piece. And the way that I'm getting these really straight lines is I'm basically just going in with my mouse, holding shift and clicking at the vertex of all of these angles. And then when I have a lot of these details figured out, I'm going to go and outline this shape on its edges with a much thicker brush. And the reason why I'm doing this is because when you're working with these really thin, really perfect straight lines, the piece and the section of the piece feels a lot busier. And what I want to do is create opportunities to break up those shapes so that they don't feel very samey, so that your eye doesn't get lost, and so that you actually know where things begin and end. And another thing that's also going to support this aspect of the design are these tapers. And I'm using these tapers to create kind of an edge, maybe a little bit of an eroded edge too, as if this object has been in kind of heavy use in some way. And it's also gonna transition from those thicker lines to the more thinner supporting detail lines. And after all of that, I'm gonna finish this off with a bit of this basket leaf texture. And I think that this is a really important part of this piece to kind of explain that you can add texture through line work into your work. There are so many different opportunities to play with texture when it comes to line. Cross hatching, stippling, hashing in general are all really interesting ways to add variety and a semblance of repetition or even patterning into your work. Another thing I'm really keeping in mind here when I'm doing this basket leaf texture is I'm trying to add a little bit of variety when it comes to the shape. The lines aren't perfectly uniform to one another, they're a little bit shakier, they're a little bit more angled, and what that's going to do is create a little bit of a natural variety to them, and it's going to be a nice kind of texture for the eye to rest on. And with all that in mind, that's our character art done. Time to move on to the background. So now that we're talking about the background and the process of lining the background, I want to talk a little bit about the brush that I use for backgrounds. So I typically use a hard round brush for all of my character art, and I use a condensed textured brush for my backgrounds. Now, the reason why I do this is because I want to have a good amount of contrast between the character work and the background work. I want the background to be a little bit fuzzier, a little bit blurrier, because the main focal point of the piece is usually going to be the character. And I kind of want my background work, especially the line work, to support that character design and support that character's prominence in the landscape and in the world. 
Now, the reason why I use a condensed textured brush instead of just a regular textured brush is because I still want to retain my stylistic kind of voice when it comes to my background work. I still want the line work to be clean. I still want the line work to retain its level of tapers, its level of boldness. And I still want it to fit in on a visual standpoint with the style of the character itself. I use this particular texture brush because I've noticed in experience with it that I can manipulate it with skews and perspectives to add different angles to certain things and on a compositional level it's a lot easier to work with. Uh, it retains filter quality really well for something like Photoshop um, without dropping in resolution in any way whatsoever. You can thicken it up by duplicating the layers. It's really an all around good brush. It works great from a thick standpoint for thick strokes and it has a really amazing texture when you work exceptionally thin with it. So that's pretty much why it's my go to brush. I have been using it for years and for so many different pieces at this point. As I'm finishing up the background line work here, uh, one lasting point that I really want to touch on for this video is the idea of tangents. And the reason why I haven't touched on tangents prior in this video is because when you're working with a lot more curved forms, like I did with the character work, tangents are really not going to be that big of a point of contention. They're pretty easy to avoid at that point, and you're not going to see them very often just because of the way that the body overlaps with itself. However, for the background, they're a little bit more of a point of contention because there are so many forms that are overlaying on top of one another, and that's one of the bigger areas where tangents can really occur. Um, let me define what a tangent specifically is. It's when a line connects to another line or another form in an awkward type manner on a compositional level. And the way that we usually combat this is just by adjusting and moving things over so that they feel a little bit more naturally overlapping and so that they don't feel so awkward. Another way that I get around the idea of tangents is by using tapering. Tapering and creating a thicker line width can also make tangents feel less severe. And with a section of the piece like this that has so many coinciding lines, creating tapers can really help in reducing the effect of tangents. It can really help in defining certain areas, reduce busyness, and also just make things feel more organized and cohesive on a visual level. So. This is what we're ending off with for today. I hope that this video provided some level of guidance or clarity about line work. Next time I will be going over the coloring and shading process for this exact same piece. And I hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks so much for watching.